Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Ulrich Althoff of Tortuga Logic, who's going to talk today about information flow analysis. Ulrich, what is information flow analysis? Information flow analysis is a way of tracking information through hardware designs. So if you have some sort of an asset or some sort of, some sort of like, let's say you have uh, secret keys stored in a certain area of your chip. Information flow analysis will allow you to determine where it, where that went over time. So when you're designing a chip, what do you have to think about when you start dealing with information flow analysis? So one of the, one of the really great things about information flow analysis and as a technique in general is that it doesn't require you to do a bunch of framing up of things when during your chip design process. Um, you can use the, use the standard infrastructure that you already use for simulation. Um, this, this is one of the strengths that information flow analysis has along with that ability to track everything around your, your device. So let's drill down into this. Sure. So Ulrich, we're looking at a house. What does this have to do with a chip? So I'm gonna use the analogy of a house to represent a root of trust. And roots of trust, everyone is sort of thinking about those and, and talking about those as being really critical for security and, and the, the security of chips these days. So a root of trust is like a house in that things have to go into houses, things have to come out. Houses are made for people. And so for example, if we bring groceries home, we know that they go into the kitchen we wouldn't necessarily take them into the bedroom or the bathroom. That just wouldn't be what we do with groceries. In a device, what you have is sim similar behavior. You have things that need to go places on the chip. And so what you're looking for here is the anomalies, right? So this is aberrant behavior over what it should be. That's exactly right. And in a home, we have a lot of insight into where things should go. But that's really been established over our entire lives. Uh, we weren't born knowing all of this stuff. And when we design new devices with new structures, state-of-the-art technology, state-of-the-art purposes and applications, the design of those systems is really something that we can better understand when we understand where things are going. We may know where they're supposed to go, but given all the interlocking parts and interactions, it's often very difficult to tell if they're actually going to those places exclusively. So you think about a car, for example, and one of the things that you're looking for in some of these devices is why is there activity going on here when there shouldn't be, right? Correct. And additionally, as from an attacker's point of view, uh, when you're looking at a device, you're looking at the external interfaces of the device. You're looking at all kinds of different behavior that could be correlated with other things going on in the device to learn about it. Those kinds of things, if they're related to the things that you'd like to protect, those secret values in uh, for cryptography, for example, or uh, machine learning model weights as another example, um, those are the kinds of things that if you observe some sort of behavior um, on the outside, as an attacker, that's related to those things, that's when you can exploit that vulnerability. And information flow analysis tells you in advance whether downstream those kinds of things are going to happen. So how does a root of trust play into this? So a root of trust is like a home in that you have things that you'd like to protect, for example, cryptographic keys. And those things shouldn't necessarily leave the device, the root of trust to the host system. So when you integrate a root of trust with some untrusted system components, you really wanna make sure that, first of all, these things can't leave, but also things can't get in and corrupt the integrity of security critical assets. So this is, this is like a home in that we have valuables inside. We don't want people to 
uh, break in and take those things. One of the issues that you deal with here is that these chips increasingly are out in the marketplace for a lot longer than they were in the past. As a result of that, you have over the air updates, you have um, uh, firmware updates that come in. How do you deal with that in conjunction with trying to understand what's going on in the chip? So often firmware updates, like, like you say, over the air updates, um, there's a protocol. So there's a firmware update protocol that guarantees the integrity of the, of the new firmware. And that integrity is, is guaranteed by cryptographic signature. That has to occur within the root of trust. So the root of trust component is really responsible for ensuring the integrity and, and proper update. And, and also to ensure that this over the air update is not in fact a rollback to an earlier vulnerable version. Does the information flow ever change as a result of one of those updates? Absolutely. So I think a very important point to make is that information flow analysis spans across hardware and software. And so if you have a piece of firmware and your firmware sets up your hardware in a certain way, that can affect your information flow through the system. And so information flow analysis is something you can use each time you have a new firmware update in order to verify that the firmware is configuring the hardware in a way such that those security guarantees are not broken. So what does the analysis actually tell you here? One of the things that information flow analysis tells you is whether or not some security requirement is being broken. So especially confidentiality and integrity so like, like we saw up here, the confidentiality would be things not leaking outside and integrity would be things not being able to come in and corrupt information inside. The information flow analysis paradigm allows you to track information through the design, like putting dye in a river or seeing if there's a way to get to the end of a maze. One of the, one of the benefits is that it tells you if it's possible. And another benefit is that it tells you, it gives you this golden thread, sort of like, uh, like Theseus and the maze of the Minotaur, how he took this thread through the maze and was able to find his way based on this. Information flow analysis can be used to determine where and what path the information took through the design. And this can give designers a really big, really big insights into what it what design paradigms are contributing to issues, help reveal some, uh, some particular things that they're, they may be doing that, uh, that are actually revealing information that it's very, some of these some of these information leakages are very unintuitive. For example, Imagine, imagine a document and some parts of it are redacted and you can tell just based on what's redacted information about the document. That's the kind of thing that could reveal information about secret information in the device. The tracing of this is a bit more complicated though, right? Because you not only need to trace where the information is flowing, you also need to understand how that can be tampered with as it flows through there. That's true. The, there, there are two points of view on that. One is if you know that if, if when you write your security requirement, you specify, you know, this is something that should not happen. And then you say, well, does it happen or does it not happen? If it does happen, that's a potential vulnerability. It's not been exploited yet. And the ways that a particular vulnerability could be exploited in the field are really difficult to imagine. So there are some that we, we know a lot about, for example, in software, there's a lot of information out there about buffer overflows, bounds checking and arrays, things like that. In hardware, your vulnerabilities can be caused by uh, small variations in the time that it takes to do a computation. That kind of thing is also revealed through information flow analysis. There's a problem here also in that a lot of the uh, attacks come with sleeper type of code where it wakes up after a period of time it's to uh, everybody's benefit, obviously, to be able to say, 
uh, we understand where the potential uh, vulnerabilities will be in the future. Therefore, we can can watch out for this. But this is not a static type of thing, right? You need to come back and review this almost in real time over the lifetime of a chip. Yes, and particularly in conjunction with with firmware. So one of the one of the things as you move up from an individual block of IP with with some specific functionality, um, those are that's much more much more testable particularly when it is, you can set the configuration and, and rest assured that, that that is the configuration that it will be delivered in. So when you move up the stack to the SOC level, a lot of the configuration happens in software. These devices are just highly configurable. And in particular, why would you produce a device as a manufacturer? Why would you produce a device that doesn't have multiple target markets if you could with just a firmware update, make it uh, suitable for one application or another. So as you, as you apply firmware on top of this, you could see how these different configurations can have, uh, can have effects on where the information would flow in the design and open up security, uh, security holes. Historically, most of the attacks that have happened on, on devices have been at the software level. But the risk is that if it happens at the hardware level, you not only control the software, you control potentially the whole system. And as the software and hardware are more tightly integrated, your ability to be able to leverage that is significantly more devastating to uh, the state of security of not only one device, but, but potentially many devices that interact. Does, all, does this trace through all of that? It does. And, and I think that that's, that's one of the major benefits is this system, this, this stage-wise ability of information flow analysis to be applied at the individual IP level and then continue with you up the stack into your full system integration. And as long as you, as long as you have the ability to simulate or emulate the behavior of your system in context, information flow analysis will work with you through that process. And you don't necessarily need to make any changes to your security requirements in order to apply the information flow analysis techniques at higher levels. Some of this can already be done at the emulation level, at the uh, formal verification. How, what's changing here and where do people typically go wrong? Formal analysis gives you the ability to exhaustively check for, for these security requirements, for, for like some sort of interference properties, um, guarantee non-interference between various elements and, and guarantee that information doesn't uh, affect outputs that would be observable by an attacker. But if you, if you try to apply a formal analysis to a device that is configurable, so, so as, you, as you get to that point where the software is configuring the hardware to do what it should do, a formal analysis may tell you something like, yes, it's possible for some, some information flow to occur. However, the way that software interacts with the system, that would never be possible. And, and in particular, this applies when you have one configuration where some secret assets are uh, you know, meant to be protected and another situation in which those secret assets, you know, they're not secret anymore. And the firmware and software has, has control over the hardware at that to make that distinction. With formal, you've, you have a lot of constraints that you can apply. So, so you, you apply constraints, but how do you know that your future firmware is going to obey all of the constraints that you set for your formal analysis? So there's that point. And then there's the second point, which is, state explosion. As you move up into more and more complex systems where you're dealing with an entire SOC with many, many different devices and, and even where you have a root of trust, which is essentially an SOC within an SOC, you have so many different possibility, possibilities for configuration of that system that formal analysis becomes un, un, unfeasible. Does this get complicated when you start getting into things like cache coherency and shared memory, potentially in-memory type of computing, and also uh, some of the uh, things that got us into trouble in the past, like uh, branch prediction and uh, speculative execution? Yes. And 
I think this is one of the major strengths of information flow analysis in general, is that information flow analysis doesn't, it considers the information. It doesn't consider a transformation of the information to be any different. So that means if you went from a certain encoding, like, like a numeric encoding to a one hot encoding, that would, there would be no loss of information there. And so your information flow analysis would tell you that information is flowing from this place through the one hot encoder and out the other side. So this applies to what you were talking about with cache timing and speculative execution vulnerabilities that really rely on this timing variation. Timing variation is just another form of information transfer. And information flow analysis is agnostic to that. In some cases, it can become fairly complicated to set up your security requirement and state your security requirement in that way. But in, in general, there's no, uh, there's no impediment to using information flow analysis for tracking timing variation. And that's cache timing channels, timing channels induced by speculative execution, timing channels that may show up in, in implementations of crypto, cryptographic algorithms, and et cetera. All right, Galtov, thanks for a great explanation. This is really interesting. Thank you, Ed.